Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. I'm Bruno Zumbo, and I'm actually beaming in from uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, we can see here that the title of my address today is The Challenges and Promise of Embracing the Many Ways of Being Human. Uh, this notion that I've been trying to really address and bring forward in, in our field. Uh, and really, I want to today. I want to talk about uh, this idea I have about a uh, ecologically informed, in vivo view of validation practices. And thank you, first and foremost, to uh, Brian Maddox for the invitation to participate today. Uh, you'll see I have um, three sections and a few remarks at the end, and we'll move through as quickly as I can. Uh, and you'll be able to get a copy of the slides in PDF as well, so you can uh, take a look at them closely. So a few opening remarks that are going to set the stage today. Um, the first is that the theories of assessment research and validation, validation practices, have become more nuanced and less formulaic in the last, I'm going to say 25 or so years. Uh, maybe even a bit longer. So uh, since the 1970s or thereabouts, the concept of test validity, this from a theoretical side, uh, no longer focuses on these conventional approaches of a correlation coefficient or uh, that is a correlation test or criteria and a conversion of discriminant validity, all of which are the evidence there is uh, a correlation coefficient or two or three correlation coefficients or the results of some sort of factor analysis to establish what is often referred to as the factorial validity. And neither of these are, are accepted any longer as um, sufficient uh, evidence for, for validity, at least in the development of validity theory. For the most part, uh, validity theory now uh, reflects an integrative approach to the process of validation involving the complex weighting of various sources, bodies, and uh, bits of evidence. Um, hence, by nature, what we're doing now is bringing the validation process squarely into the domain of disciplined inquiry and science. And so the big change here is that at one point, at least in validity theory, um, everything that was the sort of sufficient uh, evidence was uh, some correlation coefficient or some, uh, in fact, the classic uh, validity coefficient in test theory is precisely that. It's a correlation coefficient or some sort of factorial validity evidence. Uh, we've moved from that to more integrative, more uh, expansive form of validity evidence that is then brought together in a complex sort of cognitive weighting of the various information. Central to this work is the work of Sam Messick from about 1975 to 2000, an American educational psychologist uh, and, and assessment specialist, spent most of his career at ETS in the United States. I find it uh, challenging to discuss test validity and assessment research at really at the turn of the 21st century without making some remarks about Messick's views. Um, in fact, his, he and his approach loomed large on this topic, so much so that most of the discussions of validity between about 1980 and as much as 2010, maybe a little bit earlier, in some senses are extensions, responses to his earlier work or both. And most certainly my work is precisely that. Uh, particularly the, in my 2007A, this um, well-cited well chapter, I have the Handbook of Statistics. But you will see throughout um, how I rely on Messick's ideas. And so I've not replaced Messick. In some ways, I've expanded, taken in slightly different directions, and um, added um, some nuance and focus that Messick didn't have. Um, so Masek, in a series of papers, he articulated a, a unified view of validity in a series of publications. He was clear that validity is about the inferences, interpretations, actions, or decisions 
based on a test score, not the test itself. So you weren't validating a test, it's actions, interpretations, and decisions. Also, it refers to the degree to which accumulated evidence supports the intended interpretation. So part of it is this um, weighing together of evidence, but it's also a degree of weight. So a case I mean, 2007 in uh, um, book chapter in the handbook of statistics is that validity is not binary. There's actually um, a, a continuum, if you wish, of evidence or strength of evidence um, that is, is presented as a body. Moreover, validity is about whether the inference one makes is appropriate, meaningful, and useful, given the individual or sample with which one is dealing in the context in which the test user and individual or sample are working. Um, that is, one cannot separate validity from the sample uh, from which uh, one uh, from which uh, it, uh, it arises or the context in which the information was obtained. Under the unified view of validity, um, and this unified view of validity is all about the, the construct and hence the meaning of the scores. In that sense, it's very much in line with uh, Krombach and Meal as far back as 1955. So the process of validation involves presenting evidence and a compelling argument to support the intended inference and to show that alternative or competing inferences are not um, more viable. One now refers to types of validity evidence rather than types of validity. This may seem uh, a small semantic shift, it, but it may be, but in fact, it has enormous impact because now it's type of validity evidence rather than types of validity. And at one time in the history of the discipline, there was this ever growing mass of types of validity. And in fact, Messick um, responded to that by saying, no, no, let's actually think about types of validity evidence in this notion of assembling an argument as opposed to types of validity. One of the implications of the types of validity is that some, many uh, practitioners thought, well, you know, we've got a whole bunch of um, types of validity. You can even perhaps treat it as like stamp collecting and sort of order them um, in some way, uh, but not, not all of them. Or as long as you have one of the multitude of types of validity, you're off to the races. Messick was responding to this. And he said, no, if you think about the assembled um, argument, the rationale, the bringing together of a weight of evidence, now no one piece of evidence alone suffices. So validity I and mean, the evidence is, is intended to inform the overall judgment. Therefore, validation is not meant to be just a piecemeal activity. Messick and others, um, um, uh, some work that I've done as far as the mid 1990s, um, we've argued that, I'd argued rather strenuously, that validity cannot rely solely on any one of these complementary forms of evidence in isolation from the others. Some of this theoretical work is due in considerable measure to one of two. Um, bits of things that were happening. One is pressure from stakeholders and critics. And two, there's an embracing rather than merely accommodating diversity of test takers and testing settings. Um, to be frank with you, I, I sort of inject that one. Um, and certainly Messick was in, but not all theorists were motivated by, by this. More of them were simply motivated by pressure from stakeholders. Uh, when I read Messick's work, and certainly my contributions and others, Mike Kane and several others, it's also about embracing um, this notion of diversity of testing settings and, in some cases, test takers. So although developments dating back to the early 1970s by Lee Krombach, Sam Messick, and others made great strides, more recent developments 
uh, became possible with conceptual and digital innovation uh, and advances in data science. I'm going to focus on a framework that's emerged out of my revisiting the foundations and practices. And I took this on as an initiative in my research program. It began really in interest in the late 1990s and took um, and took took a stride in the first few years in uh, 2000s, um, culminating the first perhaps significant uh, part of that work being a book chapter in 2007 in the in CRL and Sinhare's Handbook of Statistics. Before that, I had edited a volume in honor of Sam Messick, actually appeared in 1998 or 1999 uh, by Springer Press. In fact, it, it, um, it, it the publication actually in great silence coincided with the passing of Sam Messick and the volume was dedicated to him. And in fact, it contained his last publication. Um, so the, my own work is to go back in the late 1990s, beginning 2000s and revisit the foundations and applications. And from that has emerged this notion of trending away and moving towards an ecologically informed in vivo view of foundation practices that embrace the many ways of being human. So I'm going to relieve myself of any aspirations to present or compulsions I have to dwell on the details and present all the minutia of this view that I've been developing. So I'm going to try and give you a, uh, a small slice and, and hopefully excite you enough about it to point you to some of the reference lists. I'm going to briefly describe, to describe the motivation for and critical concepts in this model that I've been developing to address the theme of the, the symposium on inclusive educational assessment, your neurodiversity and disability. All right, a uh, quick sip of water. And let's talk, pick up the second um, part of this, which is here I'm gonna describe this ecologically informed in vivo view and validation practices embracing the many ways of being human. And this in fact, has been funded in the, at least in the last handful of years through an endowed uh, research chair by the Canadian government, for which I'm very grateful, called the Canada Research Chairs Program. And they, um, I was awarded that about five years ago. And it'll hopefully take me for about another, take me ahead for another 10 years as I explore equity and fairness at the nexus of data science digital innovation and social justice and this ecologically informed approach and with the many ways of being human is what's emerged out of this line of work. All right, so since the publication of Messick's groundbreaking review of validity in 89, the, the field of measurement assessment testing has been calling out for a new and ex expanded evidential basis of test validation. A, a, a reviewer of one of my papers uh, a few years ago, when I responded to a statement I made like this in a paper saying, uh, I think uh, Professor Zumbo's hearing voices, uh, no one is calling for this. Uh, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to accept uh, um, <laughs> the criticism that perhaps uh, I am reading into Messick's call, but it's pretty clear from his 89 and other people's work that, you know, there has been a call for an expanded evidential basis. There's a real clear sense that we're not there yet. We're not, in fact, there's been huge changes, as I said, since, well, the 1950s, 60s, into the 70s, um, particularly in the theory, and then the work of Krombach Camille, later Messick, uh, Krombach on his own, uh, Michael Caine, and others, um, who really revolutionized how we think about validity and assessment design. Um, but I mean, there's a lot more that needs to be done and, and, and I have a view that I'm bringing to this. So I responded to, to Messick's call by blending some key ideas from construct validity, some argument-based approaches that emphasize an explanation-focused view 
emphasizing transparency and trending away from routine validation practices to shine a light on um, what I'm going to refer to as hidden forms of test invalidity. And other people have used this language as well. Uh, I've been using it for several years, and I kind of like that term. There's sort of hidden forms. And that's what the moving away from the routine approaches allows you to more fully explore that problem space or to problematize it, if you wish. It's set out about 15 years ago. I set out to develop a framework that that would embrace rather than merely accommodate or tolerate diversity of test takers in testing settings. This becomes important because for many years, what was seen as development or advancement in assessment research was to, if you wish, accommodate, or in my language, tolerate diversity of test takers and settings. I actually want to turn that upside down and I want to wholly embrace it. And that's my, that's the regulative ideal that I have. It's where I'm moving towards, not just simply accommodating, which is not in itself bad, but in my opinion, uh, we have to reach for further than that. So it's not just about accommodating or tolerating, but in fact, um, um, embracing it. This is an ideal the theoretical place from which to more fully articulate my explanation point, uh, focus view of validity. I should note, I've not had a chance to um, to add to this a uh, forthcoming paper by my friend. Uh, um, uh, there's a, actually there's some beautiful work coming out uh, by Brian Haig, my friend Brian Haig. I think it's in pr- Perspectives in Psychology, where he actually presents an absolutely elegant discussion of explanation focus. And in the course of that work, and in conversations with Brian, I realized that he, in fact, had um, suggested uh, um, an, an idea of an explanation-focused view a few years before me. Uh, and so I think it's important to recognize that. And I'll gladly share that citation with you all. He has a paper that's uh, in press at Perspectives in Psychology as Brian Haig, H-E-I-G, which is very lovely, actually. Um, so the, the explanation sort of explanatory model um, is embedded within this ecological model of item responding that is situated within a pragmatic view of abductive inference when one develops uh, validity evidence through tests through abductive reasoning. And you're looking at initial conditions and doing rather than hypothetical deductive or purely inductive approaches, um, I, I do. I really push for this inference to the best explanation, IBE, and this sort of abductive strategy that I articulate. Uh, so, as in contrast to inductive reasoning or deductive, the abductive reasoning neither construes the meaning of the scores purely from evidence nor assumes the meaning um, to explain the score itself. So it's a lovely. I. The philosopher science, philosopher of science uh, who have influenced me have really uh, persuaded me that this, and many others, that this abductive approach is a powerful lens from which to work from. Uh, so abductive reasoning seeks the enabling conditions under which score meaning makes sense. And it serves as a conceptual foundation for inclusive educational assessment neurodiversity, and disability. So you'll see here that I'm working within a a pragmatic philosophical tradition, and I'm not interested in um, conventional causal views of explanation. I work from a a, a philosophical position uh, where causation is only one possible view of explanation. And this this view of test validation is reflective of Messick's sense of substantive validity, which focuses on evidence about the process of responding and how and why people respond as central to validation. Um, So this explanation-focused view has this ecological approach 
that allows the researcher to focus on anthropological, political, sociological, structural, and community contextual variables. The anthrop anthropologic in particular there, as well as the contextual and ecological, is a nod to my friend Brian Maddox, who's really influenced me in this direction uh, a great deal. So this ecological approach or situated approach is tied closely to the notion of in vivo. It's, I'll let you sort of reflect on this and take a look at it afterwards with the slides, but you know, it's, it's, it, 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 there's really a rhetorical move from how the environment affects the person to a type of interactivism in which the test taker is situated within these enabling conditions and these highlight processes and forms of influence uh, on the test taker and um, on the performance as well. Uh, and that these are really uh, entirely absent from the standard view of uh, Eidman test responding. So in 2015, I have a citation uh, in the previous slide. I really unpacked this idea with some colleagues, some of my former grad students. Um, and I'll, I'll let you take a look at the validation embraces the many ways of being human. And in this sense, um, because it's initial conditions, I really do, we really do push forward this notion of uh, um, the encounter being, uh, if you wish, bathed within this ecological situated notion. And it lies outside of individual notions of cognition. Right, and this I think I'll let you sp spend some time in the 2015 paper, but I do want to highlight that the way I set this up uh, philosophically, if you wish, and methodologically, it is to foster this many ways of being human and acknowledging that. All right, let me say a few words about uh, this inclusive educational assessment and neurodiversity. In particular, I want to talk about some principal challenges and opportunities. Uh, there's actually a nice paper that just appeared a, a few months ago um, in a special issue of the journal, uh, European Journal of Psychological Assessment by uh, myself, Brian Maddox, and Naomi Kerr, in which we spent a lot of time thinking about the process of responding. And we presented a sort of holistic validity framework bringing in the process and product. And we're very interested here in test validity in a computer-based assessment where really the innovation in technology can now foster the exploration of these um, um, enabling conditions and this, this um, interaction and this placement of the individual within the situation. Um, uh, we addressed in part to what extent to the uses of process data uh, and all these process ideas reflect the principles of deliberate educational and psychological measurement. And very importantly, in this paper, we actually consider the case of item response times and the potential for uh, variation associated with disability and neurodiversity. So this is actually a case in point of having exactly the thing I'm describing in action. There's only a little bit, there's more to be done in this area, but there's some, um, I think some very exciting things to be done here. Um, at this point, I think it's instructive to keep Mike Kane's description in hand where he writes in his language, I, I be Mike Kane, I think of validity is the extent to which the proposed interpretations and uses of tests are justified. So justification requires conceptual analysis of the coherence and completeness of the claims and empirical analyses of the inferences and assumptions inherent in those claims. Mike's view is actually, um, he approaches it quite differently from where I, he begins somewhere uh, um, with a slightly different and from a slightly different purpose, but certainly our, our ideas, and Mike and I have talked about this, are not divergent. They're in fact, um, they're, they're actually, in fact, uh, I'm not sure if the word is complementary as much as they are not antagonistic. 
Um, and in fact, one can begin to think about this explanatory view within Keynes' uh, framework. And the approach that I'm looking at brings Keynes' ideas in it as well. So they're quite nicely linked. Um, I argue that um, in test validation, the rationale, that is the validity, should lead to the selection application of appropriate evidence validation. The distinction between validity and validation becomes important here. Thing to distinguish them um, often leads to, to a very sort of public, problematic methodology of confusion where um, a theory of validity is described as an activity. So what is, what is validity? It's a correlation. What is validity? It's fact analysis. What is validity? It's mental probes. Think aloud. No, you need a theory of validity. All of those, if you wish, are modes of disciplined inquiry to provide evidence for the validity. In my thinking, in, the, in my theory, validity is the explanation and all of these approaches are the kind of evidence you would bring to support that a claim of validity. There's an important paper here, and, and we're not too far away from being done, uh, uh, by Camilla, uh, Camilla Adi, uh, by Maddox and I in 2020. We, we state that as a social practice, really validity is a social practice, we began to talk about assembled validity in there. And it suggests that validity arguments are assembled, assembled iteratively in a dialogue. As, as validation evidence is identified and collected and new actors are enrolled. And the actors in this case is going to bring in this idea of your know, diversity, about uh, the many ways of being human. And um, this idea here is going to lead to um, what I want to offer as an extended methodology. So the task of dem democratically assembling validity would be to identify and reconcile, rather than rebuff, identify and reconcile the, the plural legitimate theories of different stakeholders through epistemologies and contexts. So now we're going to open up assessment. That I'm trained originally as a mathematician been now about a little over three decades as a, a professor, research scientist. And um, the idea as a mathematician about opening up the, um, or the whole enterprise of assessment to social and to a larger audience is a little bit terrifying. And I remember uh, decades ago, uh, um, uh, Professor Harry Goldstein, uh, in the, uh, but I was at a conference there in the UK and he was in Canada. And Harvey was very, uh, he was wonderful. He talked about this um, anxiety that some of us, in, I in particular, I don't think he was talking about himself, feel when we begin to open up our closed little world of assessment, mostly around statistics and validation strategies. When we open it up to others to come in and expand the interpretation to have ownership over what we do. And in fact, in, 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 in a sense, I a tip to, have to Harvey, I'm going to say this is exactly where we're going by applying the adiomatics uh, and I, the kind of approaches we were doing there. So this is an ideal space to implement Addy et al.'s description of co-construction, democratic engagement to diverse members of this test taker and stakeholder populations. Last point that I think is important, essential to this democratic engagement are principles of true consultation. And in a moment, you'll see that what I'm suggesting here is actually comes and is modeled on uh, part of the Canadian Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution and UNDRIP, um, forgive me from memory, I think it's the United Nations Declaration the rights of, um, of Indigenous peoples, um, they talk about um, the duty to consult. And I want to bring that here, modify it, because consultation needs to have information sharing, resolution of potential 
adverse impacts to what we call the experiential experts. And our experiential ex experts now come from a context of test takers and stakeholders who are uh, deeply uh, in, um, within a um, particular uh, communities of neurodiversity and of disability. So now we're going to talk about information sharing and, and potential adverse uh, and resolution potential adverse impacts to the experiential experts. And I think this becomes important to call them experiential experts. If not, it's a type of faux or fake consultation. And that's what the ANDRIP and the duty to consult is working against. It entails listening to and accommodating concerns and being willing to amend test design proposals and, uh, in the light of information received and providing feedback. And a dialogue must ensure that it leads to a demonstrably serious consideration of the experiential experts requests, no full consultation. So now I've taken you from the very beginning where validation was a correlation coefficient to our factor analysis, bringing in the beautiful tapestry that Messick has brought Rombach, Messick, the work of Michael Caine, uh, and then moving that forward to this explanation ecological view and um, explanation focused and the many ways of being human and that being recognized through the engagement, through serious consultation and democratic engagement based very much modeled on the Addy Maddox Zumbo ideas to now talk about engagement at that point in the test design, in evaluation, validation, and research. Some closing remarks. First, uh, we should be mindful that the findings of a large metasynthesis um, reported in journal results is not so rosy. Um, as Eric Chen and I in the published volume of this meta metasynthesis, basically a lot of practice just still reflects correlations and factor analysis. You're, we're seeing changes, but it's nowhere near what people like me who get very excited about the concepts. So there's still this large gap between practice and theory. And really, two categories of evidence in that book in 2014 really were almost totally ignored, one being response processing and the other one evidence of consequences. So although there's now a significant body of research on this more nuanced view of assessment design validation, there's more work that needs to be done to move uh, assessment practices in this direction. Lots of papers, lots of books on the theory. We now need to look at things like the symposium to contribute to important steps forward to uh, um, begin to operate in this more nuanced environment. I provide you some references here. Um, and again, those are part of the PDF that you can access. And uh, of course, I want to acknowledge the University of British Columbia, uh, where I hold my uh, um, uh, distinguished university scholar position and professorship, uh, as well as my funders from the Canadian government uh, and the university itself. Uh, please contact me. I want to thank you very much. I hope um, to engage with you uh, later in the symposium and at another time. Thank you.